My name is Dr. Miles Reed, and it's a pleasure to be here sharing some of our personal stories and experiences with our beloved teacher and, and consultant, as he used to like to be called, Carlos Castaneda. My name is Aaron Alexander, and uh, actually that is the name that Castaneda gave it to me. My birth name is Maria Guadalupe Blanco, and I was born in Argentina, and that is where I met him first. Yeah, I was born in the United States, in Baltimore, Maryland, uh, but I grew up in Argentina. And um, I was actually on my way to India to do a master's in Ayurvedic medicine at the University of Benares when my life totally took a, a turn, 180 degrees. Uh, my path brought me faithfully to meet Castaneda and everything changed. I think maybe my, the story of how I met him, it's a very fateful story. And uh, when I was a teenager, I was uh, beginning to explore the world of spirit for the first time. I was brought up in a, in a household of uh, intellectuals. My parents were, were my scientists and uh, of European culture. So I was very much a product of the European uh, way of looking at the world. So I began reading the books of Castaneda when I, when I was a teenager and uh, my world was turned upside down completely. I could not stop reading. I was literally walking down the street and I was reading his books while walking. And uh, he opened up to me a whole other way of looking at the world. There was all of a sudden there was mystery and I had never been exposed to mystery in my household and my upbringing. And uh, he also brought in that the access to mystery was through an experience of the whole body. And that really called me deeply. So I always had his, his books sort of like, a, like, I think, thousands or maybe millions of people around the world um, as almost like a manual. Uh, from which I tried to guide my, my actions in my life. Even though they were not written as a manual, they were written as a, his personal accounts of his own experiences with his teacher, Don Juan Matus, there was no other option, no other vehicle to how can we take this into our life, right? So I was reading and, uh, and trying to live this all through my teenager years. And then when I, was, I went to medical school, and uh, did traveling around the world also. I took a sabbatical and uh, would carry his books in my backpack. And, um, and then one time in the early 90s, I, I heard I was living in Argentina. I did my medical school there. And I, I heard through a friend of, a, of a, a woman who had actually met Castaneda, who was interested in getting together with other people who were also interested about his work and discussing her own experiences. She was a philosopher. She was from the academia circles in Argentina. And uh, at that time, within those circles, his writings and teachings were controversial. Was it, is it for real? Is it uh, just a storytelling? Um, so, but she met him because he went down to Argentina to give uh, some lectures. And uh, she was transformed because that, was, that happened pretty much with anybody who came across him personally. He had uh, an incredible charisma and uh, he touched people's lives very fast and uh, in many cases transformed them for good. So she was desperately trying to find other people who were thinking like her. And so I was absolutely immediately said, yes, I, w I want to meet someone because it was the opportunity to make a bridge to someone who actually had met him, and it was not just the, the book writings. So six months passed until actually this took place. And uh, in this meeting, there was about 25 um, adults, most of them from the intellectual uh, milieu of, of uh, Buenos Aires. And uh, everybody wanted just to talk about themselves, which is something that he always 
will <laughs> teach us. You know, we, we all want to tell our story. We don't really listen to others. We don't really want to know about the other ones. We want others to see us, right, to be recognized. So everybody wanted to give their own opinion about their books. Nobody really was interested, I realized there, on what she had to say or, and what was her real experience. And so I didn't really ask any questions. And um, there was one other uh, person in the group who also seemed very interested, keenly interested, like me. And I, I saw him and I said, wow, this guy also is really interested. So the meeting ends and nobody proposes even to do a follow-up, right? Everybody exposed their own way of thinking and, and, uh, and then off they went back to their lives. But I stayed and uh, this other guy stayed. And then is when the meeting really started. And we really uh, forged a, a very special relationship, the three of us. So indeed, she had met him and uh, had spent time with him. And uh, so the three of us began to meet. And uh, in that moment, immediately, this was in the maybe 1992, 93, um, she tells me, you have to meet Castaneda. You, you, you seem just perfect for him, for, for what he thinks. And uh, she was very enthusiastic about me meeting him in person. And I, I, my take there was, if fate is, my fate is such to meet him, it's going to happen by itself. So um, a year passed, and at a given moment, we split, the three of us. She went back to the United States, to Los Angeles, with the purpose of trying to reconnect with him and the circle of his. Uh, he, was, you know, he was someone who, you, nobody knew how to find him. He, he, was, he wasn't reachable. He, you couldn't f call a number and, and, or anything. He, he was um, purposefully outside of the, of, the, of the limelight, let's say. So she had a contact number, and she was trying to go and, and pursue it. And she gave me a number that she had from her daughter in, the, in Los Angeles. And she said, if you come to LA, Oh, yeah, in the United States, call me. My, the other friend of ours, the, of the three of us, also, he went on his own way traveling through South America to try to, f to see if he could get to the United States and find him. And I pursued my, my medical residency, and, and then I um, organized to go to study uh, postgraduate in Ayurvedic medicine because I had been to India. I was kind of like a, more like a hippie type, very bohemian. And uh, I was interested in, uh, in, in the Eastern philosophies. And I, thought, I saw myself becoming a Ayurvedic doctor and even living in India. And so a year and a half passed since I had last uh, been in touch with her or my other friend. And I was in San Francisco, and I was actually on my way to the East Coast to then go to India. And, um, I had a feeling, a feeling, I was walking at night uh, in, in, the, uh, in the street, in the, in the city, and I had a feeling to turn left on that particular street. I, th I thought, there may be, I was looking for, a, for interesting bookstores to read about philosophy and, and, and all those things that were deeply interesting to me. And uh, our, our teacher used to call the cubic centimeter of chance, when uh, a very tenuous, a uh, small thing, an impulse that leads us to make a phone call or to approach a person that we met some time ago or, or to, you know, open an email that in that moment and whatever for teachers in detail that makes you then uh, a lead appears and then you follow that lead and it ends up transforming your life completely. It ends up being something monumental. And so my feeling of turning that corner led me to actually, there was a bookstore there. And the moment I, I turn, I see that there's a, a sign uh, for a, a workshop in Hawaii of Castaneda. I had no idea that there was even something such as, that was something available to the public. And I was immediately like, wow, they're doing something in public. And my second thought was, I need to call my friend. And I pulled up, I had her phone number in a paper I had kept. I had not seen it for a year and a half. And I call her, and the moment she picks up the phone, she says, oh my God, I can't believe that you called me. 
you have to come to Los Angeles. What happens? I say, I have a ticket to go to the East Coast. I'm going to, to, for two years to India. She says, I just been invited to a personal class with him. And I have not seen him or her. I've been trying all this year and a half to reach him, to be invited. And finally, I managed to do it. And you call just now. This is fate. I don't know, but you, you have to come. And then she says, but hold on. I don't really have a number to call him. I had a, someone else's number that they connected me and they called me to invite me to this class. So, but I don't know, this is so weird. And so she says, look, call me tomorrow morning. And just call me tomorrow morning. So I hung up and uh, I called her tomorrow, the next day, and she says, you're not gonna believe what happened. And by the way, this is the time there were, there were pay phones, there was no cell phone. So I had called her from a pay phone in the streets, and so she had no way to call me back. And uh, she says, right after you hung up with me, guess what happened? Castaneda called me. <laughs> and he had, never, he had never called me before. And so he picks up, he, I pick up the phone, it was him, and he says immediately, and I say to him, about you, I tell him that, you know, who you were and, and how we had met and how he had just called me. And he says, bring him over, invite him. So I just followed my impulse and I changed my ticket and I flew right away to Los Angeles. It was that evening was the, this class. And, um, and then my, my friend, the philosopher says, you know, and there's another surprise, you're not gonna believe it. You will see it tomorrow. So I am walking past the street in, in Santa Monica uh, to a, go into a yoga studio where this private class was happening. And, uh, and the moment I am walking across the street to come into the class, across the other side, guess who walks by? The third uh, other friend of the trio. He had also come across all South America, arrived to the United States maybe uh, eight months before, and had been also equally trying to be invited uh, through our link with a philosopher. And they had also invited him to the same class. So all three of us faithfully meet once again at the class with Castaneda in person. And everything changed. I, um, what year was that? This was in, uh, in uh, 1994, 95. And he invited me to have lunch the next day with my friend from Argentina who ended up becoming a direct apprentice just like I did and Aaron did. And this was a, a very small group of people. It was 16, 15, and uh, it the fate that brought us together from the first meeting in Argentina. Uh, and something in me that knew that if my fate was to meeting it was going to happen by itself, and that's how it happened. And once it happened, he took me the next day to lunch, and, and, um, and I was in awe because he was so, it was like, uh, being with him was like, like, a, like a drug in a way, an elixir, and you couldn't, you couldn't get enough, you wanted more. Um, but it's also, there was a big intensity because after a, a while, you just needed a break because it was so intense, his personality and the energy around him. But then the moment you left, you wanted to see him again, right? But it, he took me to, um, uh, to lunch to uh, his uh, place, uh, a Cuban restaurant in Los Angeles that he used to take people there and uh, he used to go himself, the Versailles. And, uh, and then in the parking lot, he tells me that uh, the spirit had pointed me out to him for the reason of, because I was a doctor, I was going to someday uh, help bridge the knowledge of Don Juan and medicine and health. And, uh, and then my whole life took a turn and has never returned to the place it was. Um, I started reading the books of Carlos Castaneda at my house. I was 13, 14 years old. And the books, the teachings of Don Juan, Journey to Exlan, The Fire from Within, they were on the bookshelf of my family in Spanish because my aunt 
used to work for the Fondo de Cultura Económica, which was the publishing house of his books in Mexico. And um, no one in my family ever talked about Castaneda, neither opened those books, paperback books. But I was always drawn for some reason to them. And, uh, and I started reading them. And they became, everything makes so much sense to me, where he will talk in the books of having separate realities, multiple realities. And, um, and then my life continues, and I was raised Catholic. So I always knew about spirit and about praying and about um, something larger than us. And I loved going to church and on mass, seeing how my parents and all of us in our family will get to church pissed off and late and moody and crampy. And something transformative, amazing, will happen with the smell of the incense and the singing and the calling of the energy of Jesus. So whatever it was, the prayer, that everybody will get out of mass smiling, happy, and hugging. So I always liked that. I never understood it, what was that process. But I loved it because then my parents will be a little nicer and my brothers less moody and crampy and creepy with me. And then I always wanted to bring that transformation in my house, not only on Sundays. I was always yearning for that to live it every day. And reading the books later on as a teenager, I will feel that. I will feel my body, suddenly my heart opening. And I couldn't understand anything. But what I did as when I was around 15, 16 years old, I entered into a group of the teachings of Gurdjieff, that is um, Eastern philosophy and the, the dances of the, has to do with the dancing of the, um, the cervix is called? The dervishes. Dervishes. Sufi. The Sufi teachings. And also I didn't understand what I was doing there, but my spirit felt so alive. And in that group, we stay with that, I stay with that group, we will meet every Saturday to study and read and do movements. And um, one day the, the coordinator of the group, there was a couple, of, a man and a woman, uh, Annie and Diego, and Diego brought up the thing of, hey, let's start reading Castaneda. And I was so happy because I was doing that already for many years. I was 17 by that time. And so we started reading Carlos Castaneda and, uh, and, and calling into the teachings and his energy. So I was very familiar with him, but I never imagined him as a human being alive. Years went by, and one day, one person from my group, she said, Castaneda is in Buenos Aires in Argentina. He's giving a talk. And I said, what? And I start, my body start kind of being very nervous and kind of shaking, you know? And I, because of my personality, I, anyway, I went home. I, I didn't even dare to say, hey, I want to be in the meeting. I, I just I was a little scared, actually. I went home, and that night, I dreamed I was in that meeting. And I dreamed everything that happened. And I dreamed with him telling me, you have to come to the US. That was 1994. On 1995, on May, at the beginning, this was at the end of 1994, at the so a few months later, we get to know that Rosa Cole, which happened to be what Miles was talking about, that woman that ushered him to meet Castaneda. She was organizing a workshop of Carlos Castaneda's teaching in Buenos Aires. So I met her, and I went to the workshop. And Carlos Castaneda colleagues, Taisha Abelar and Florina Donegrown, both of them also wrote incredible books about their experiences with Don Juan. Uh, I met them at the workshop, and Taisha said, you are coming with me to LA. And I was like, wait wait a minute. I, I had a job and a boyfriend and a life in Buenos Aires. I said, well, yes, <laughs> oh, 
okay. And uh, a few months later, I was in LA, and there is when physically, for the first time, I saw him on the stage. And uh, the worship was Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. On Mondays, after every worship, he used to have a tertulia for the Spanish speakers on Monday mornings around 11 o'clock, which so he funny. loved. And he was, yeah. It he, was the funniest thing. He was oh. a hilarious, incredible moment. We were maybe 40 or 50 people, uh, Latinos, that used to come to these worships in the U.S., from Mexico, from South America, from whatever. You know when you, when you laugh at the, the belly hurts and you say, please, I can't laugh anymore Stop because it. it's pain from so much laughter. That's how funny he was. He was making basically fun of himself uh, because he said, here it is, Carlos Castaneda, are you guys disappointed? Because he was <laughs> short and, and brown and it didn't look like the intellectual or whatever people had expected him to be. So it was such a delight and sweet and loving. And he really, really cared for you. And he would look at the eyes and said, go for it. Believe in your spirit. Go for your heart, deep desires. Anyway, so in that meeting uh, in 1995, I think it was October, it was October 1995, after the first worship that he taught in Culver City, there were 300 people in the Culver City, it's a high school, high, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Culver, Culver high. City High School. I went to this talk, which actually was, this talk was in the ballet studio in Santa Monica, which right now I'm taking still ballet classes there in the same place. And he gave this talk and there was 45 of us. And after the talk, I was gathering my stuff and leaving, and Rosa comes and said, hey, he wants to take you lunch, me and another three more people. And I said, okay. And we went to lunch, it was around 2 p.m., to the Versailles in Venice and Motor, the same restaurant. He left to go to that Cuban place. And, uh, and we sit down and have lunch, and he looked at me and he said, what do you want? What, what is the purpose? And I was like, I don't know. And I knew in that moment, he would talk a lot with his body, more than with, um, you know, more than, it was more like a bodily experience being next to him. Yeah. And in that moment, I realized I, was n I never had a purpose in my life. I didn't know even that I could intend something. And he says, stay here. I was like, what? And my physically, again, I had like a shake and I start weeping, I start crying, you know, tears were rolling my eyes and I was thinking, man, how embarrassing. I'm in this first lunch with Carlos Castaneda and I'm weeping like a little girl, you know. <laughs> I wanted to show him that I was strong and, and show off my whatever, right? And so we left, and the next day he called me again, called Rosa call, and I was staying in her house. He used to have an apartment renting in Culver City. And he said, let's go and have breakfast at the Pacific Dining Car in Wilshire. He used to also go and sneak and have an early steak in the morning. And I uh, went to have breakfast there with him and Rosa, which Rosa is an incredible, philosopher and teacher, and Rosa is a beautiful human being. She, she, she lives now in Argentina. And, uh, and we were having breakfast, and I knew that I will never go back home, that I will have to say goodbye to my relationship and, and my job there, and I, I couldn't not, not stay. It was an opportunity for me to transform my life and open up. It was beyond any rational understanding. And he said, well, what did you decide to do? And I was like, oh, man. And he said, OK, I, I'm, I'm going to stay. And Rosa also supported me with that decision. And I, look, I didn't speak English. So I, I, I went to, anyway, 
that that is where the story, how the story starts. But it was uh, a calling from deep inside, something bigger than myself, that started actually years later. I got to understand that my mother, when she was pregnant with me, she used to pray to the Virgin of Guadalupe because it was a very difficult pregnancy. And Castaneda will tell me about how the Spaniards, when they came to Mexico, the Virgin of Guadalupe was actually a deity from the Mayans. It was a dark virgin, the dark skin. It was this uh, powerful force of connection mm. to the spirit. So this, I think my connection to him and to Mexico started when, when I was formed in my mother's womb. It was even, it's something inexplicable and much larger than I could ever, I think, comprehend. Yeah, yeah. You know, it reminded me, uh, the, the way the, the apprenticeship developed in general, the, the, say the, the unspoken rules was they were never, we were never forced or insisted upon anything. Uh, it was always a, a very subtle invitation, a subtle, yeah. a, a subtle comment. And then if we were, and he had this expression, to be energetically available, uh, which meant to be open and available to the spirit, to whatever the universe, he called it it, uh, or, or intent, um, because he, he conceived it as an impersonal force uh, rather than a, maybe a, the representation of a, of a god as, as, a, as, a, as a persona. So it was, it was a, an impersonal intelligence um, to which we are directly attached to and we are like an expression of. And life is a journey where experiences invite us to develop our, our consciousness, our awareness, and in that way the universe itself is developing its own awareness through us. Right? So it was always a, an insinuation. And if, we, if you are not energetically available, if you would like say, well, I call you tomorrow, let me think about it. Uh, um, yes, but, he always would make jokes about but, right? Because we, are, we, are, we always kind of put complaints or we put excuses or we, we um, you know, our own comfort or insecurities uh, don't allow us to be available to the, to the invitations, the solicitations of the spirit, he called it. And so um, it, was, it was always a very tenuous thing. Uh, you know, um, I remember, for instance, um, one of the, a project that was a, ended up being a huge project, which was the book Magical Passes, that it was, it was the one book, see, because he, he a lot of his writings, especially in the first years, were, um, th th they were the expression of uh, direct experiences that he had, and many of them happening in, in, in Mexico, in a completely different environment and context, and yet he was a man of, uh, of the Western culture. He was an, an urban man. Uh, his home was Los Angeles. Uh, and so a lot of those experiences that are, are, are almost like far-fetched and far out and extremely appealing, uh, but they, were, they did not really belong to him or belong to our time. And he was, uh, he, it, was it was very important in this tradition that he had learned from his teacher uh, to be a, someone in alignment with our own time. Like for example, if he would be alive today, he would completely embrace the, the, the the world today is so different than 20 years ago. Um, social media, internet, the whole intricate web of complexities that we are faced with. So uh, his uh, later, later books are more an expression of what he wanted to transmit to us. And so, for example, this book Magical Passes was the, the, the one book where he uh, portrayed uh, a, what was a a daily and a, and a huge aspect of our apprenticeship, which was so movements, movements, movements. And, uh, and, and how to bring consciousness and, uh, and deliberate awareness of our body. You know, for, for, for him, there was no really a difference between mind and body. It was just one unit. And nowadays, we, we take that almost like a, like a 
scientific fact, uh, which it is. But at that time, it was you know we tend to divide you know mind and body, and and so all of our practices and our, and our training was were very much uh, to bring us into the in connection and in awareness of our body. So the movements were, were a huge part. It was about energy, the redeployment, right? To be vital. He used to say, hey, to be young when, you know, to have youth, to be youthful. Youth, when you're young, is so easy. But to be young in your 70s, like he was, that's sorcery. <laughs> and he was, I mean. He was younger than all incredible. of us. Incredible. He, he was in better shape than we were. And we yeah. were in our, in our 30s, you know, and he was in his 70s. Can you uh, talk about, uh, because I, I, I get the intellectual that he had in his mind, can you go into the love and devotion he had with Don Juan? Because okay. I, I, what's, what's missing in the conversation is devotion and love, because I think that's the spark. Yeah. People always forget what brings us together. Can you go on that? Sure. He, he um, all the time that we interacted with him, he would always talk about Don Juan. He would quote him, he would say what Don Juan would, his take on, on this or that was, or, or how he, you know, what he would say. And, and he always put himself behind and, and Don Juan in the forefront. He was, um, his, his devotion and his respect for, for Don Juan and, and as his mentor, his benefactor, he called him, um, was, was imbued everything. And, and, uh, and, and he himself, Castaneda, even though he is often seen from the outside as someone like a recluse and, uh, you know, kind of mysterious and maybe uh, unavailable and perhaps even detached emotionally, he was the most loving person you could possibly yeah. meet. He, uh, for me personally, he was the kindest man. Uh, he was, um, uh, and he was generous to the inch, beyond. He's, he actually sacrificed his own physical body from the, from the affection and the, and, and, the, uh, and the generosity of his spirit. Yeah, he used to say, you know, I need time, I run out of time. He was ready to leave the planet by the time I met him. And he wanted just to stay because he gave it such a kick to be able to help us, to really, hey, you don't need to believe your thoughts. You can not only change your thoughts, transform yourself and restart your journey of consciousness. He was like the link between us and a spirit, between me and a spirit, to help us to plug again into the universe. And uh, he was generous of his time. He was anytime available. Come to see movies, we will spend a lot of time watching. He loved martial arts. He was a black belt of Kung Fu. And uh, he studied for many, many years uh, Kung Fu and martial arts and how to redeploy your energy and heal yourself through movement. And he, so he loved the, the old Chinese movies of during the, the 70s of martial arts. And uh, so we, he will call you three, four o'clock in the morning, come to watch a movie. And uh, we will spend a long time just watching movies that they will inspire us to be disciplined, to focus uh, our mind in our present and time on healing yourself. And uh, it, it was the most, it was a way of love and loving and receiving love impersonal. You know, I was, I was telling Miles this morning how, you know, we became parents. So you learn to love your child in a way that is unconditional, in a way that has no words. And I, I love my parents that they already passed in, in incredible ways. And I love my husband. But the way you love your teacher, and your teacher loves you, it's just, it's indescribable because it's impersonal. He never wanted anything from me. He used to tell me, I need you like I need a hole in my head. <laughs> 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 you know, he didn't need me. He was doing it just because yeah. of the love of it. The, the love of, of, for life, for being alive. And life is consciousness. 
for him, life and awareness was the same thing. And it was such a um, delight for him just to see you thrive and awaken and say, hey, hi, Nawal, I just found this cool thing in the newspaper today. He just loved that. He loved us going from down, looking down my feet. I mean, I was so depressed. Yeah. I, I, I tried to commit suicide when I was a teenager. I, would, I carry a lot of darkness on me. So it was, he, he used to, you know, explode like a Christmas tree of light and love when he used to see me. Oh, I get it. That is not me. That's my ego. Oh, I get it. You know, so, yeah, there's, there's no words to express his what was, love. Did, did he study other things like, I believe in the Christ is in everybody? Yes. Did he... Uh, did he study Christ or uh, Muhammad or any of those things? And most teachers that admire other teachers, like what was his what was his take? I can tell the story of when Don Juan left and how desperate he was trying to find another teacher. You know, when uh, he used to tell this story that when it's kind of funny and when Don Juan left in 1973, he departure this world and he said I cannot take you with me you are not ready you have to leave and close the lineage right he you want to talk about the lineage a little bit of the seers yeah I, I the mean if, if, what, with, what happens with with him is you know he was a, a, a um, um, like I said a academy academician a Western thinker and uh, he went into the field to to uh, where he met uh, Don Juan from a from a research point of view and 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 trying to to make a name in, in academia and circles and anthropological circles um, and uh, and he was basically swallowed by the cognitive system of this tradition that came from what today is Mexico before obviously the, the conquest. So uh, he was completely taken by that. He lived from within that. It was an all-encompassing proposition that he uh, was available for and, and, and took him. So he, I, I think during that time where he was an apprentice of, of Don Juan and Don Juan was alive, um, he never, I, I don't think, I, I'm so, I, this is my own interpretation because he never spoke specifically about that, but there was no space for him uh, exploring other type of teachers and, and traditions. He was uh, trying to just come to grips with, uh, uh, you know, because what was a, a field of study became a, uh, just from the, the cognitive propositions that were presented to him required for him to, to submerge himself within that fully, completely. And, uh, and uh, to that extent, I think, is where things open up. I, in my personal experience, for example, when I de consciously, fully decided to become his apprentice, I, I, I moved to Los Angeles, and I was, I was driving uh, my car. Um, I, I knew that I had to strip myself naked from all my beliefs, all my, my personal history, and be completely open to what was going to be presented to me. Um, and so I think then after Don Juan leaves this planet, continues his own journey, and all of a sudden Castaneda is trying to find his footing, right? Uh, you know, the, the, the first thing was the calling of, of this lineage because Don Juan had brought him something that was not even Don Juan's. He represented Don Juan a, a, a very specific lineage. Uh, each lineage had its own guide, they call him Nahual, like I said, and had a s small group of, uh, of apprentices. And the whole purpose was for that small group to develop their consciousness, go back to infinity, and train a new group. And all of this transpired throughout generations and hundreds of years in secret. And, and so then after, when Don Juan leaves and, and think 
then is when the Nawal is trying to find He's, himself yeah. and uh, find other teachers that, that could represent he what he... He has a story when he went to India with his friend, a friend from LA, took him to India to see a Swami. I don't remember who he was going to see sure. in India, a guru. And so he was a little reluctant because he, you know, always dressed like in the 50s with a tie. He didn't born into the 70s culture of the hippies and all that. So they go to India and they arrive, imagine flying from LA to Bombay and then they have to take another flight. So he said they took like three days to get this little town up in the mountains. And by the time he gets there, he said it was hot and he was tired and filled with grief of having lost his teacher and, and moody and with all those feelings inside of him. So he arrives and the, the Swami was going to uh, bless all his students. So Castaneda said, the, the, his friend said, hey, let's go, let's go. He's going to shop, get out of his house and, and bless all the students. There was a group of 20 or 30 people they are gathered by the time they went there. So he stood up, Castaneda there, and the Swami comes and start talking to his student. And, and Castaneda was like, Oh gosh, I don't know if you stay here or just run away, I don't, you know. And in a moment, the Swami grabbed a bottle of, of a liquid and start throwing the water in, saying a prayer and a blessing. So Castaneda gets the blessing and says, "Okay, I should just, you know, follow. Maybe I should follow this. Maybe I should follow this." And then there, are, suddenly he, he, the water. He, he has a smell and. He licks the water, and it was the pee of the teacher, the water. So Castaneda, you know, he starts, you know, he says, no, no, you know, this is not for me. This is not for me. So he grabs the bag, and he flies back to L.A. And he was through a period of feeling really lost, and the books, the writing, where was, and trying to rewrite the stories, and the encounters with Don Juan, what was his kept him connected to him? Uh, but definitely in his house, Castaneda had a huge library uh, with more than 3,000 books. And he, was, he loved to read philosophers, yeah. uh, like the German philosophers. And he had a lot of books. He read everything and everyone. But he always used to say that his teacher was Don Juan. And he had a link with the connective system of ancient Mexico, the Toltecs and the Mayans. He was con that was his source of his teaching. He was connected to that. Okay, so let's get into this. Let's get heavy duty now. So J.R. used to say that the Mayans were from another place. That yeah. they, they, they're from gone. From the stars, yeah. So does Castaneda, because that's maybe where it comes from, Don Juan, <coughs> and the Mayans, and Castaneda. It's all one. Do you, did he ever talk about the Mayans and Atlantis in other lifetimes? Yes. He, he, the, yeah, the, the Nawal, he, he uh, um, had a special thing for a particular areas of, of the stars, like the Pleiades in particular, um, Orion, uh, Corona Borealis, and Coma Berenices were the the hallmarks that, that he said the, the knowledge of the ancient shamans and seers was linked to. And, uh, and particularly the Pleiades as, as the source, as, as home. And uh, he always talked about that uh, the, the knowledge comes from the stars and we mm -hmm. come from the stars. And, um, and so, uh, like, there's a myth Maybe you want to also mention about the, 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 the yeah the Quetzalcoatl. Uh, There's a very a primary uh, myth from Mesoamerica that represents the, the, the journey of transformation and, and integration between a, the, the serpent and a bird. Um, also, in the, all the traditions of Mesoamerica, it's linked to also to Orion and the Pleiades as a journey that is a journey from home and then the journey of of the path of heart, which is a journey of our life. Yeah, and the symbol of a plume serpent, of a dragon, is in all cultures, in Japan and everywhere. 
And uh, even what we teach today, we are hooked into the plume serpent. And Castaneda will talk a lot about the plume serpent because the fascinated um, is a serpent, coatl, right? That has the contact with the earth. So it's your physical realm reality of first attention. And then the bird that brings the, the knowledge of the abstract. And it's bigger when they join together when the serpent develops the wings, becomes bigger than the sun. It's not just the serpent plus the bird. It becomes something that is Quetzalcoatl, which is a third, something that is mysterious, that is embodies the bird and the simplest plus. So he used to say that we are mind, body, spirit, plus something that we don't know. We are mystery. We are spirit, the universe. Yeah. And I think he definitely knew as a man of knowledge and also used to talk about how, for example, Ramdas, that he, he was uh, from his same generation and all of that, they were all talking about the same. We are all connected and we are all a mystery. And we are trying to explain with different languages and traditions what we are here and where we come from, how long mm. do we have? Did he talk about Mayan? Yes. Yes. You want to say a few things about that? Uh, all the, see, he, the, the tradition that he was exposed to comes from the, the, the cultural milieu of Mesoamerica. The Mayans, the Toltecs, um, the, all were the, the Teotihuacanos, Teotihuacan, the Tula. Um, the, these were all areas in Mesoamerica that span from what it's Guatemala today to the southwest of the United States, including Chaco Canyon and all the, it's this, this corridor of commerce and cultural exchange that has existed for thousands of years and it spans in all that geographical area that today is divided in countries but is meaningless in terms of this tradition. So all the, 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 thi the ways of thinking, the, the cultural exchange, and, and the mysticism is all shared throughout these cultures of Mesoamerica. He would say that this tradition was a Toltec tradition, but he also said that it was just, that's a way to just to classify because we all, uh, we kind of laugh sometimes at that. We all have this need to, to neatly classify and divide and compartmentalize. And that's kind of like a, also a need that is mostly a need of us men uh, because we live and we have been living in a men's dominated world. And he was very much, uh, a lot of our training, which is very practical. He was a very pragmatic person. And it's how to live and how to conduct yourself day in, day out. And he was all about bringing forward uh, women's resources and power. Uh, that the, the, the ticket for evolution for our planet has to come through the, the women waking up to their true potential yeah. and power. And, and in, 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 our, you know, in our experience, like when I came in, I'm a doctor, I'm a man, I'm used to things happening. And the men, we were kind of like second-class citizens, you know. The <laughs> women were, were the most important ones because he wanted to revert the social order. So he needed to support the women to get them stronger to, uh, to, because he said, look, women are the ones who have the, the direct channel to the stars and to, to information. And so uh, if, if, we, if the women don't wake up, we don't have a game as, as a species. So when, when I met him, so when I met him here and after those first weeks, we went to Mexico with uh, him and another three, another two women, the four of us. We flew to Mexico and he took us to Tula and to the Atlantis, because there is where the tradition started. And the Atlantis represents... Where, the, where is Tula? Is by Cancun? Tula is two, no, it's two hours north of Mexico City. Okay. Uh, in Cancun, uh, in Yucatan, you have the incredible Mayan city of uh, Chichen Itza. And this is where we go to teach every year. Uh, but we went to Tula and Teotihuacan. He took me to Tula and Teotihuacan to, uh, to ask permission, actually. He said, this is an incredible story. It was me and my partner, Larian, we both students of his. 
and he said that two of us, he will bring it to the lineage for the spirit to open the doors, the lineage open the doors for us to be part of it. And uh, he gave a seminar in January 1996 in Mexico City in a hotel. The, there were around six, seven hundred people. And all the profits from the seminars he donated to an orphanage in Mexico. And I can, again, no tears comes to me because he was such a generous, generous guy. Generous, And he had a thing with orphanages because he himself, his mother died when he was six years old. So he knew, and he was practically raised by himself and his grandmother. So he knew what is to be raised without parents. And he always wanted the, all his money from his books. This information, even it is today, his trust to go to an orphanage and help others. So the, all the profits of the, the net of that worship went to uh, an orphanage in Mexico City as a, because he was thankful that the Spirit brought to his life me and Darien to carry his knowledge and the knowledge of the ancients of, Sears, of ancient Mexico. He, so that yeah. speaks so much of his humbleness. If I have to summarize Castaneda in one word, just humbleness as its best. Yeah. Because he, he tru truly didn't, didn't uh, think that he, uh, any of this belonged to him. No. As he always taught us to, to, to embody that. that uh, it you comes know, from the spirit, from the universe. You know, the, he, he talks about four enemies that all of us encounter in our, in our search for knowledge. And uh, they go uh, fear, power, clarity, and old age. And uh, they may be a linear, but there's also, they, they're not so linear. Say it again, fear. Fear, power, clarity, and old age. Yeah. And so he, he, part of his cognition was that there, there are four enemies that all of us encounter in our quest for knowledge, in our path to knowledge. The first one is fear. And uh, it has to do with, uh, you know, he said, most of us in life, we shortchange our possibilities because fear stops us. We shy away from fear and we then don't take up opportunities, say no to what the universe brings to us, the challenges it brings to us because we fear, we fear outcome, we fear not being included, we fear being criticized, we, we fear. And so he would say we have to, in our path to knowledge, go into the fear. And, and, and trans, traverse the path through fear. And then you come out of it stronger and, and learning more. And so when you come out of fear, you, you realize that you can do things, that you have power. strength, you have power. Yeah. And, and all of a sudden, power becomes the most amazing drug that, that fills your veins and it's, it's delicious and, and, and you can do things. But then you get to think that the power is yours. Exactly. And that's when you fall prey to this, to this uh, challenge because, and this is how he embodied life. This is anything, anything that we, all our achievements and, and, and our, our capacities, is we are conduits of something bigger, of, the, of, of this intelligence, it, the universe. And, and so then you start, when you, okay, you, you it's not me and mine, the power, and, and, but yet I can exercise, I can be a good conduit. And then you start to, to understand things. You start to get it. And then comes the enemy of clarity. That It works like this. You begin to believe that you are the one who knows better, that you know things. And once you begin to think that it's you, then it's, see, all, throughout all these enemies, it's, it's the ego. It's the, what we, he would call the me, me, me mind this me first kind of thing that we kind of get trapped in. And so there is the, is the me, me, me mind that begins to think that it's special, that knows more than the others. And then is when clarity nails you and you succumb. And, and then lastly, man, the, the old age, that's the one enemy that he said 
can only be deterred, can only be pushed back, you can only adapt and maximize, but eventually it's gonna get you. We can't really overcome that last one. But you can, and we, in, our, in our current uh, expression of, of his teachings that, that with Aaron, we have a uh, form which we call being energy, and it's based on, on, on him, on what he, we learn from him. Uh, we, we try to take all these four uh, essential components of teachings and, and work with them and uh, try to you know, change our biological age but increase our awareness. And, uh, and he was all about uh, having a ball in life, the experience of life, and uh, to maximize our potential. And that's, we try to em embody that in our life. So tell them what you want to know, uh, and then we'll end. Um. There's no words to say, really, thank you. Thank you for every, every day calling and, and pushing me to take me beyond whatever I thought that I could do, I couldn't do. And you used to ask also that question of what's new? And it was such a difficult question and I never knew how to answer. And today I know that you know. And uh, uh, I have an answer. You know, it's like everything right now is coming into place in me in this moment. Everything that you told me, I've started getting to really have a feeling of it. I know that I am a question mark that cannot be defined by words. And I, it's incredible the link I feel I have with you. I, I have dreams with you all the time. So I wanted to know that I, I am present, that I didn't give up on myself. And I am incredible, thankful, and I will see you very soon. Nawal, I'm so thankful for you opening the doors of infinity to me and allowing me to come through and, and for transforming me. I'm still working with every single thing you try to teach me. And especially when you said one time that you said that you're, you're, you're very in enterprising but your flaw is that you're enterprising only for your own benefit. And you told me, I'm never going to say this again. I say it only once, and I will never repeat it. And I want you to know that I'm, I haven't forgotten, and I'm, I'm still working on that one. And I'm trying to remind myself to be more generous like you are, to think of others like you did always. And thank you for teaching me about elegance. You know, I was this hippie with a doctor with long hair and, and uh, you completely changed my wardrobe and you dreamt me as an elegant being and uh, you brought that not just in how I dress of course but just the, the essence of elegance in how to live life and, uh, and thank you for the incredible opportunity to have experienced you uh, and, and being close to you for all that time and uh, and to carry through, as we, we're trying to do our very best with Aaron, to carry through your teachings, and, uh, and we see you, and I see you every time I can get out of my ego mind, and I'm in silence, and uh, you still guide us, and we are following that. Thank you. I love you. Love you. <laughs>